Hi folks, uh, my name is uh, David Villar and uh, welcome to this uh, presentation on basic mechanisms of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. A little bit about myself, I'm originally from Spain, did my master's at the University of Illinois, went on to do my PhD in Aberdeen with all the lovely Scottish people and scientists at the Macaulay Institute, and then I went back to the US and did my residence in toxicology at Iowa State University. And for the past uh, 12 years, I've been teaching pharmacology at the University of Antioquia in Colombia. So in this uh, first uh, presentation, I'm going to try to show you the way uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, work in probably a very simplistic way. We all know how you can complicate uh, things all you want in science and in the end get blown away and don't really learn anything. Uh, my problem is, uh, as you will see, is that I tend to simplify things probably too much. So if we start uh, with this simple scheme of an inflammatory process, uh, we could say that an inflammation is basically a non-specific response of the organism when it's a challenge with either a chemical, physical, or biological harmful stimulus that will cause a tissue injury. So it's just the response of the body against any of these insults. And as you can see here, uh, the five uh, cardinal signs uh, which are uh, typical of the inflammation are uh, heat, uh, redness, pain, swelling or edema, and uh, loss of function. And all these signs basically are, are a reflection of the local changes that are uh, taking place in the local vessels, uh, which are uh, written here. And the two basic uh, purposes of the inflammation are to fight or repel the insult whether it's a foreign body or a toxin or a pathogen or what have you. And the second reason is basically to repair the damage on those uh, injured tissues. So in this respect, you may wonder why should we give an anti-inflammatory drug to stop the process uh, which has so many advantages? Well, the reason being is quite simple. Inflammation does not come without some trade-offs. There are some disadvantages, uh, which are, for example, pain, uh, pain does not really serve any purposes uh, beyond being just an alarm system. And once we know what the origin of pain, in, pain is, uh, the sooner we alleviate, the better for the recovery of the animal. Uh, the other problem of inflammation is that uh, it in of itself uh, causes uh, damage to the tissues. Uh, those uh, neutrophils are not very specific in the, in the way they work once they release those uh, uh, lysosomes. Uh, to the damaged uh, tissue. Uh, the other uh, reason is that uh, uh, inflammation, if it, if it becomes uh, chronic, is very difficult to treat. And as you can see, another downside is the loss of function, uh, which is another cost that you have to pay for having inflammation. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that it's a good idea to always uh, suppress inflammation because it's obviously a defense mechanism of the body against any, uh, against any type of aggression. And what I'm trying to tell you is that if you know what the aggression uh, is, uh, you basically attack or eliminate the aggressor uh, with a specific treatment or therapy, and then you can just give the anti-inflammatory drugs so that you can relieve the body of those side effects that come along with the inflammatory process. If I had to give you the most important reason why we probably want to suppress inflammation, uh, I would say pain would be number one. A constant uh, pain creates a situation in the body in which uh, is a kind of a self-perpetuating uh, cascade of events uh, in which uh, the sympathetic nervous system is constantly overstimulated, the animal is under uh, constant stress in a catabolic uh, condition, if you like, 24 hours a day. And the pain goes, uh, may go from being uh, just a nociceptive at the very beginning to being inflammatory and to become a neuropathic in which basically there are no uh, uh, mechanisms in which you can uh, turn it off or switch it off. And when the, ba when the pain becomes uh, chronic, it, it's basically a disease uh, in of itself because uh, the individual is basically unable to function and carry out its uh, normal life. So to end uh, the talking on this slide, there are two possible outcome, outcomes uh, to an inflammatory process. The body is able to win the fight against the aggressor and is able to repair all the damage if the tissues are capable of, of uh, regenerating and then the inflammation disappears without leaving any traces like if nothing ever happened and the other outcome is when the body cannot eliminate the aggression, 
in which uh, case the inflammation becomes chronic and this is uh, characterized by the presence of a scar tissue that replaces the normal tissue and there is usually a permanent uh, loss of function. If we look at this other slide, now we have inflammation at the, at the very uh, bottom of the graph and uh, everything on top is uh, what I would call a magic. Uh, I imagine uh, it's all true because there are a lot of people uh, which are uh, much uh, smarter than I am that have uh, worked all this out and proved that uh, when tissues are uh, injured uh, those uh, cell membranes uh, get ruptured or released and then the phospholipids are uh, free to react with enzymes uh, from surrounding tissues and basically they convert all those uh, phospholipids into arachidonic acid which as uh, you can see here uh, it's uh, further converted by other enzymes into uh, leukotrienes and uh, prostaglandins and those two type of molecules are just two important type of uh, inflammatory mediators uh, which basically set up uh, and continue that cascade of events in the inflammatory process. Now as you can see here the prostaglandins are just uh, one type of mediators uh, which uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories uh, will suppress uh, by inhibiting the enzyme cyclooxygenase and the story could probably get much, much more complicated. From these uh, graphs, I would also like to uh, point out that uh, when the cell membrane is uh, injured, uh, those uh, phospholipids enter what, what is called the arachidonic acid cascade. And as you can see here, the glucocorticoids uh, are probably the best type of anti-inflammatory drugs uh, because they inhibit the phospholipase uh, which uh, blocks the production of that arachidonic acid and by doing so in such an early state of the cascade basically you get a huge uh, profound effect on the inflammatory response they basically uh, is not shown here by but uh, the glucosteroids also uh, suppress the responses of most of the white blood cells and other functions of the immune system and uh, if you were to do any surgery uh, that's probably why you don't want to use uh, glucosteroids because uh, they basically suppress all the healing process and the regeneration of the tissues uh, wh whether it's the skin or whatever tissues you've been performing surgery however if we were to use uh, non-steroidals you don't really influence the action of the white blood cells which as I say are crucial to clean up any debris and dead tissue that you leave behind during the surgery and by doing so we don't really delay any repair of those tissues. Let's now say a few things about the prostaglandins which uh, as uh, we said before are the target molecules that will not be produced when we give uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They're called uh, autocoids which are uh, local hormones in other words these are uh, hormones which are uh, produced uh, locally in just about any uh, place uh, throughout the body and uh, the target uh, cells are usually present in the vicinity of the site where they are uh, secreted and now the most important thing that uh, we should probably remember is that the prostaglandins apart from having an inflammatory role initiating the, the all the cascade of events that we just mentioned pain fever swelling heat and so forth they also have an essential physiological role now what's that role well they have uh, an essential role uh, protecting the mu mucosal integrity of the stomach. Another role is protecting the blood perfusion in specific sites like the kidney. Another role is protecting or, well, I should say regulating the tone of the smooth muscle in the uterus. So we could say that all these are housekeeping duties of, the f of uh, prostaglandins. In other words, they have physiological roles apart from the inflammatory roles and you don't really want to abolish any of those roles because that would result in side effects or if you like development of toxicity uh, by the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Now is there anything we could do to prevent those side effects from taking place? The answer is yes. And I borrowed this uh, slide from Dr. Ferguson, as you can see the type of prostaglandins that are produced and which are essential f 
for, for the body are synthesized by different cyclooxygenase. The cyclooxygenase 1, which is present in those tissues that I, I just mentioned, uh, are usually produced at very low levels and uh, are present in the GI, particularly in the mucosa of the stomach and the kidney, particularly in specific areas of the kidney, and also in the platelets. By contrast, the enzyme that produces the prostaglandins in really large quantities when there is an inflammation is the cyclooxygenase 2. And as you can see, this is usually present, to, it's not shown here, but it's present in white blood cells, fibroblasts, chondrocytes, endothelial cells. And if we were to target this enzyme, with the specific non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that don't affect the cyclooxygenase 1, as we will see in another video. This is really a breakthrough discovery, a revolutionary discovery, because now we have really safe non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that we can give long-term, for, for example, for treatment like osteoarthritis in animals, and don't really uh, affect essential prostaglandins in those uh, other tissues. Now, the other th thing that I wanted to show is this uh, other picture, just to remind you that the most sensitive organ to the side effects of uh, non-steroidals is by far and away the stomach. As you can see here, uh, in a minute, uh, prostaglandins, as we just showed, is, uh, are crucial for the production of the lining of the mucosa uh, of the stomach against the gastric acid. And if we give uh, non-steroidals and we take away that protective mechanism, uh, you're basically going to make that stomach uh, vulnerable to develop uh, gastric ulcers as uh, is shown here on this slide. Now, how do the prostaglandins protect the mucosa of the stomach? That's uh, shown on this other slide. As, as you can see here, basically the prostaglandins are essential to produce that uh, protective layer, which is on top of the epithelial cells. And that layer is uh, rich in bicarbonate and, and mucus. And basically what it does is uh, prevents the acid and the pepsin of the stomach to become in direct contact with the epithelial cells. And without those layers, the cells will basically be exposed to the acid. And as you can see here, uh, aspirin and some other uh, non-steroidals work by blocking that uh, prostaglandin production. And uh, it, it also prevents the bicarbonate production and the mucus layer production. We will also say in future videos that uh, you don't really want to combine non-steroidals uh, with uh, glucocorticoids because the glucocorticoids increase the production of the gastric acid and the pepsin and by doing so obviously you're increasing even further the risk of developing uh, gastric ulcers. Well this was uh, my uh, last slide until the next video. So the idea was basically to show you the some of the basic mechanisms of action of uh, uh, non-steroidals, how prostaglandins uh, work and so on the future videos we'll talk about the pharmacokinetics of uh, non-steroidals and we'll say specific things about each one of those uh, drugs. So until next time, uh, take care and uh, bye bye for now.